This is In Black America. There is a great deal of uh, diversity in our black community that there are hard issues like the issue uh, of um, homosexuality and homophobia, like issues of uh, racism and anti-Semitism and issues of sexism and sexist depression, issues of sexism, that they can look at this book and look at and see that I'm trying to grapple with these hard issues and that yet there is material in the book that they absolutely identify with and realize and recognize. In other words, that even though I may be different, you know, from some of the people who read the book, I mean, of course I'm different because I'm only me and Mm -hmm. nobody's an identical clone of anybody, at least not yet. (laughs) But the thing is that I would want people to look at the book and say, and have that like ring of human recognition, like, oh yeah, it's not right to treat people in such and such a fashion. Or I never knew that there was a black lesbian poet named Pat Parker. She seems like she's a really good writer. Barbara Smith, author of the book, The Truth That Never Hurts, writing on race, gender, and freedom, published by Rutgers University Press. In her book, Smith brings together for the first time more than two decades of literary criticism and political thought regarding gender, race, sexuality, power, and social change. As one of the first writers in this country to claim black feminism for black women in the early 70s, she has done groundbreaking work in defining a black women's literary tradition and examining the sexual politics of the lives of black and other women of color. I'm Johnny O'Hanson Jr. and welcome to another edition of In Black America. On this week's program, Barbara Smith, author of the book, The Truth That Never Hurts, In Black America. Sexuality, unlike race and unlike gender, pretty much, is mutable or changeable. I mean, if you're born black, you know, right. you're going to die black. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But the thing is, because there is an acknowledgement, a coming out process, whatever you want to call it, that indeed one's identity, sexuality identity could change, I think that's threatening to people. I think there's some people who think that non-heterosexual relationships are sinful or criminal mm-hmm. or are sick. And yet, if you look at the past, going back to antiquity, including uh, antiquity in Africa, you will find evidence of same-gender primary uh, relationships. And that doesn't mean, I, I'm not, I never debate uh, with anyone right or wrong, mm-hmm. you know, around sexual orientation, because that to me is not the point. Barbara Smith is co-founder and publisher of Kitchen Table, Women of Color Press. She has been a writer in residence and has taught at numerous colleges and universities for more than 25 years. She is the first woman of color appointed to the Modern Language Associations Commission on the status of women in the profession. Smith is an independent scholar who has played a groundbreaking role in opening up a national culture and political dialogue regarding the intersections of race, class, sexuality, and gender. In her work as a critic, teacher, activist, lecturer, and publisher, she was among the first to define an African-American women literary tradition and to build black women's studies and black feminism in this country. Recently in Black America spoke with this innovative author. I have uh, edited major anthologies about black women, Mm -hmm. and I started doing that work in the late 1970s. I was teaching African-American literature on the college level, and I also was um, teaching black women writers. I was one of the first people in the country to look at black women's literature. And uh, as I said, I uh, edited a number of collections, anthologies, uh, during the late 70s and early 80s, uh, three. And then I also co-authored a book on racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, last year I had two books come out. So uh, one of them uh, is The Reader's Companion to U.S. Women's History, and then there's my own book, uh, The Truth That Never Hurts. So that's, I think, about six now. <laughs> okay. You're also the founder of Kitchen Table, Women well, of Color well, Press? Uh-huh, that's right. And how did you happen to uh, found that organization? Well, I was the co-founder, um, and when we started in 1980, we were the only publisher for women of color in the United States. And the way that came about, um, I was friends with the great uh, poet and visionary Audre Lorde. Mm-hmm. And Audrey and I were talking one day on the telephone. I lived in Boston 
then. This is the late 19... Well, actually, I lived in Boston in the 70s, and this is on 1980. She was coming to Boston to do a black women's poetry reading, and we had had various experiences with independent feminist presses and publications, etc. And she said, Barbara, we really need to do something about publishing. And therein hangs a tale from that day until, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess, pretty much now. Uh, Kitchen Table has been my baby. But still, when you look at those uh, television shows where they interview people and, you know, the talking head type shows like Nightline or Meet the Press or whatever, they're almost all white people on those shows. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, if they do interview any black people, they generally are black uh, men. And if they interview any women, they're usually white women. So it's still, you know, even though some things have changed, uh, there's still a need for that effort. Could you give us a little history of the black women's literary tradition? Well, actually, it starts... Um, in the 17th century, if you want to be, you know, like, mm-hmm. just strictly chronological, uh, there was a poem that was written by, everyone thinks that Phyllis Wheatley was the first black right. uh, woman poet, but there was actually a woman whose name, I believe, was Lucy Hammond, and mm-hmm. she wrote a poem called Bar's Fight, and uh, that predated um, Phyllis Wheatley's work. But, of course, she was not, the person who wrote that early poem was not um, a, uh, you know, literary uh, figure didn't get, get to do as much work as Phyllis Wheatley did. But it's a very long and, uh, you know, old tradition. Um, Phyllis Wheatley, you know, then in the 18th century, um, and um, been trying, you know, we've been trying, I think, ever since. I think that whenever you look at uh, history of black literature, whether it may be male or female, you have to look at the situation of slavery and, mm-hmm. and know, of course, that we were forbidden literacy. The tools of uh, written and uh, written expression uh, up until you know, not even the end of slavery ended that situation because when you're denied education, uh, you can't get to a level of ease with the language that you can necessarily become a writer. So we have an incredible uh, literary tradition, given that we had to fight mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, even being prohibited getting the tools, which is the tools of literacy itself. Um, I think that, um, you know, like beginning in the 1970s, as I said, there have always been black women writing, but uh, black women writers were not seen as a particularly uh, significant uh, group within the black literary tradition. Uh, and they were not seen as doing anything that was um, unique. And I think that uh, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, there was a critical mass of black women in graduate school in different disciplines. And we wanted to study things. You know, it was a time that black studies was uh, being uh, born and right. women's studies was being born. We wanted to study things about ourselves, you know, and that was uh, regardless of what our field was, if it was sociology, history, anthropology, you know, it didn't make any difference. Religion, literature, as in my case, we wanted to study things about ourselves. And as I said, you know, there always have been black women writers. Some of my favorite black women writers, like Zora Neale Hurston, Margaret Walker, Mm -hmm. and uh, Anne Petrie, were were, uh, writing well before, you know, the midpoint of the century. But um, I was lucky to meet Alice Walker in the early 70s, she was teaching a course in black women writers, which had to be one of the first ones ever offered in the country. And that was in Boston, where I lived, and I got to audit her course. And uh, I swore that the next time I got a teaching job, I would teach black women writers. And one year later, I got a teaching job in Boston, and I've been doing that ever since. But as I said, we built um, it, so, so to speak, from the ground up. And I think it's been really positive uh, for the black community to have uh, these voices be known. Are there any young writers that we should keep an eye on or, or be looking for their particular work? Uh, absolutely. And I probably, uh, that's not a question that I've been asked before, so like I may uh, forget some people that I really want to mention. Uh, there's a young man named John Keane, uh, whose uh, book of stories, I'm actually waiting for my bookstore here to get to me. I've uh, ordered it, and he uh, lives in New York, a uh, very fine writer. John Keenan, as I said, he writes uh, short fiction, and I'm sure is working on a novel. Uh, an, an, a black woman poet who I love is named Letta Neely. She lives in Boston, and she has uh, published her own uh, book. I'm sorry I'm not able to supply titles uh, mm-hmm. for you, but uh, you can find them you know, by name. Uh, that's Letta Neely. Um, trying to think of other people who I've read recently. Um, 
I'm, I'm drawing a blank, uh, okay. but they're definitely uh, younger writers uh, who I appreciate greatly. Uh, Lisa Moore, uh, who actually is a resident of Austin now because she's studying at the university, is a uh, young black woman publisher. Her press is called Redbone Press, and uh, she's doing a phenomenal job of publishing uh, black women writers. Some of the essays uh, that are included in The Truth Never Hurts was written over 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. How did you go about the process of, 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 of compiling and deciding what essays will be included? Mm-hmm. That was a real process for me. It wasn't <laughs> just like throw everything I had into the book and say it was a book. Okay. I gave it a lot of thought. And one of the things I think that reflects that I gave it a lot of thought is that the book is not arranged in chronological right, order. Right. It's arranged by sections, you know, different uh, subject matter right. uh, uh, is what, how you know, the uh, book is arranged. The first section is about literature and history, and then the next section, uh, which is um, called Between a Rock and a Hard Place, mm-hmm. is about the issues that divide people from each other, which include racism, homophobia, and anti-Semitism. The third section of the book is called Working for Liberation and Having a Damn Good Time, and that's uh, the section where I write about doing political organizing, because I have always been very active. Uh, politically on a grassroots level. And then the fourth uh, section, which only has one piece in it, is an essay that I wrote specifically for uh, the book. But um, I looked at all of my work and I considered carefully if I wanted it to be in that kind of permanent form of being in the book. There are some things that I did not include that were probably as well written as things that I did. Mm -hmm. It's just that I didn't think they necessarily needed to be in uh, the book because sometimes uh, I, I would do assignments, and I have done assignments that were kind of occasional, so to speak, like they were based upon some current event right. uh, or something like that. But um, I thought long and hard about what to include, um, and I did include a couple of book reviews because that's how I got my start as far as publishing uh, my work was concerned. And um, just fi- trying to figure out how things uh, went together. One of the things that people say about the book who've read it is that it doesn't seem like it's a lot of different pieces that were all written at different times, that it really does flow. And that's because I gave it a lot of thought. And some of the essays focus deeply upon racism and how that has affected you in the beginning of your, of your childhood. Mm-hmm. Why was that important for, for that particular train of thought to be transmitted? Well, I think in this society, yesterday, of course, was uh, the official celebration of uh, Reverend Mar- Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, birthday. Mm-hmm. And it interests me as somebody who grew up during the Civil Rights Movement and who actually saw King on more than one occasion speak in person. Mm-hmm. So he is very real to me. He's not just somebody on a calendar or on a McDonald's commercial. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Right. And um, as I, I, I mentioned that because in some ways the way that the holiday is celebrated uh, really does highlight the superficiality with which white Americans view racial reality in this country. I think that most people who are not people of color in this country don't really understand what racism racism is and how it works. They also don't understand how deeply and profoundly it impacts impacts our very day to day lives, you know, um mm-hmm. that it's not just a sometime thing, that we deal with it every single day. And and it has um grievous and violent impact on our lives. And sometimes it just is merely annoying. But whether it's annoying or whether it's tragic, like with the lynching of James Byrd in Texas Mm -hmm. last uh, June, whatever that range is, we deal with it every single day. And I wanted people to know, uh, by reading my book, I wanted people to know what my relationship was to all that. And uh, I do tell some stories about things that have happened uh, to me personally that were the absolute result of uh, racism and which could have uh, been more violent than they turned out to be. In your opinion, why is it such a difficult task for this country to come to grips with race relations and why the problem is is so difficult to solve or to articulate? mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, this country is an inc- is incredibly hypocritical. You know, um, this country, as I say in one of the essays uh, in the book, which is called The Tip of the Iceberg, mm-hmm. uh, and I talk about, how, and this is not original with me, I'm just reiterating it, that this country was founded on stolen land and stolen labor. 
the stolen land was from the indigenous people because mm-hmm. the Europeans came over here and said, I like this, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to take it, <laughs> as if, right. you know? <laughs> and I don't know if you know that joke that Dick Gregory used to tell about. That's just like if I see a Cadillac on the street and mm-hmm. he thought I want it right. and claim it and say, I like it, it's mine, I'm going to take it. That's what happened. You know, that's what colonization means. And this country was colonized by the Europeans. So stolen land. And then pretty soon they realized that it was so vast and there was so much to be done that uh, they wanted to exploit, you know, people's labor. They began with indentured servants, but, of course, if the indentured servants were white, they could melt into the, uh, mm-hmm. the dominant population and disappear. And so someone got the incredibly horrific idea of importing us as African slaves. And I think the reason that people in this country to this day, the last year of the 20th century, the last year of the second millennium, Mm -hmm. I think to this day the reason that most people in this country do not want to deal with what we're up against is because it would mean, number one, they would have to change, and number two, they would have to be honest um, about what the benefits are of living in a white supremacist country, because this is still a white supremacist country. How did you come up with the title, The Truth Never Hurts? Uh, it's, a, it's a truth that never hurts. And um, I, I always say that I think that sitting on the porch one night, you know, one summer evening in uh, Cleveland in the late 1950s or early 1960s, I was listening to the people in my family talk, and someone saying, well, that's a truth that never hurts. It's kind of ironic, and it's a little bit of a joke, because the truth can hurt. Sometimes you don't want to hear the truth, you know, but as we know, this truth can set you free. So um, I just, I, I was trying to do like a little irony thing, a little, you know, paradox thing of like, yeah, the truth can be difficult to uh, deal with, but uh, if you can deal with it, it's really going to make your life better. It's not going to hurt ultimately. You have a long list of academic accomplishments and credentials, but you have chosen to remain an independent scholar and not particularly stay at one academic institution. Is there a method to the madness? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, John. <laughs> I really do. Um, it's not that I'm a gadfly, you know. It's not that I wanted to you know, go from place to place or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, independent scholar, as I say, I am gainfully unemployed. <laughs> um, writing was always more important to me okay. than anything else. And uh, I wanted to organize my life in such a way that I could get as much writing done as I possibly could, and I knew that a full-time academic career was not going to allow for that. Um, also, I was a publisher, uh, was involved with Kitchen Table Women of Color Press for 15 years, mm-hmm. from 1980 through 1995. So that meant that an ac- a full-time academic appointment was not going to work uh, with that responsibility either, because uh, running the press was more than a full-time job. So for various reasons, um, I think that being an independent scholar, uh, the euphemism, <laughs> mm-hmm. perhaps, uh, that has worked for me. It means that every single year I had to try to figure out how am I going to make it this year? Okay. You know, what am I going to do to try to uh, earn a living? Uh, one of the things that it has meant uh, for me, and this is not that great of a sacrifice, is that a lot of, uh, you know, uh, material, you know, consumer goods or objects or whatever, mm-hmm. I'm not really into that. I'm more into, uh, like, art and ideas and travel, things like that. Mm-hmm. It's not that I spend no money. It's just <laughs> that uh, I don't have to have the newest of everything. Um, I would like to have security as I approach uh, elder age. But um, hopefully, you know, I've been provided for by uh, whatever forces those are that look down on us. Uh, up until now, and I hope that I'll be able to succeed you know, in that way in the future. Does black feminism take on a, a, a different term than the larger population view feminism? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, black feminism, uh, if nothing else, has a strong race, race analysis. Okay. that We understand that we're not just affected by gender politics, or gender oppression, but that we are indeed uh, affected by race and racism. And in fact, I always tell people the first political situ- uh, situation and issue that I knew about was race and racism. And I still feel racism more strongly in my gut probably than any of the other issues that I deal with because I feel like, for one thing, we were talking about why, why is this country so unable to deal with uh, its history of racism. 
one of the reasons that I think I feel racism so deeply is because it's so embedded in every single institution of the society for good reasons, which I believe are uh, largely economic reasons. So, and, and, and economic re- reasons that serve those who are very, uh, you know, uh, privileged to this day. But in any event, uh, as I said, uh, black feminism does look at racism. It looks at class and economic uh, issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks at all those things that affect um, our lives and our communities. So as far as I'm concerned, police brutality is a black feminist issue. And uh, quality education for our children is a black feminist issue. Violence against women and stopping it is also a black feminist issue. But uh, it's not as simple, you know, as uh, just getting some good job in some executive suite, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have other things that we have to deal with. You state in some of your writings that the ha- the Harlem Renaissance, those writers that were part of that, that, that illustrious period in, in black America were gay and lesbian. Mm-hmm. Why, uh, up until... This last half of the, of, the, of the 20th century has this information now coming out. Well, I think uh, because of um, the nature of the closet okay. and of homophobia in the society as a whole, no one was going to say that they were lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgendered before a certain point. There are some highly unusual uh, people, very brave people, who did indeed acknowledge uh, their sexual orientation mm-hmm. before the modern lesbian and gay liberation movement, but by and large, it took that movement uh, that began, you know, kind of uh, arbitrarily Mm -hmm. with the Stonewall Rebellion in 1969 in New York City. That was a confrontation between the New York City police and the patrons of a bar called the Stonewall Inn. They came in to that bar, much as they have done in uh, places where black people have assembled, Mm -hmm. uh, to beat heads, to disrupt, to tear up the bar. A lot of the patrons, indeed, of the Stonewall Inn were people of color, both, both black and Latino. And as I said, that's generally considered to be the beginning of the modern lesbian gay liberation movement. It took that for us to begin to look back at other historical periods and to really try to figure out what was going on. But when I write about that in uh, the book uh, about the major, uh, so many of the major figures being lesbian, gay, or bisexual, that is documented and proved. You know, uh, mm-hmm. it is not a matter of opinion at this point. It's fairly widely known. And uh, it's very interesting to me because uh, the Harlem Renaissance, and me as a person who's a literary scholar, the Harlem Renaissance was our pinnacle. Right. And the thing is that to, to re-look at it and say, wow, so what does it mean that so many of the people involved uh, had non-heterosexual, uh, emotional, and sexual um, connections and lives? You just have to look at it a little bit differently. And I don't think it means anything. I mean, the quality of the writing and the art, that itself. stands. I mean, that's forever, you know. I think it just means that there were some things, there were some things that were going on socially, you know, um, within our black communities during that time that we did not know about, but that some of the leading lights, you know, of, the, of uh, those periods, that is, artistic and intellectual leading lights, obviously were exploring, and it wasn't, it's not as uh, cut and dried as we thought. There's a lot to be found out. Why is homosexuality such a, a taboo subject or tinged of conversation in the African-American community? Well, that is a really substantial question, and we could do another <laughs> half hour about that. But uh, that's something that I have been concerned about uh, for many years and have written about, uh, have done research on, etc. Uh, I think people are afraid of uh, difference, okay. uh, just as white people, you know, uh, you know, have issues around people who are not white. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that people who are heterosexual have issues around people who are not heterosexual. Okay. I think there is a fear around sexuality in our society. We have uh, this Puritan heritage, um, and that Puritan heritage affects those of us who are a black, uh, you know, uh, a black, who have black identity, who are black, even though we're not Puritans. I mean, Puritanism mm-hmm. is not an African thing, but we, we've been here for a number of centuries. It affects us, and they certainly did give us their religion, you know. Right. Uh, and so that's one aspect of it. I think another aspect of it is that sexuality, unlike um, race and unlike uh, gender, pretty much, is uh, mutable or changeable. I mean, if you're born black, you know, 
know, right. you're going to die black. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, because there is a, an acknowledgement, a coming out process, whatever you want to call it, that indeed one's identity, sexuality identity could change, I think that's threatening uh, to people. I think there's some people who think that um, non-heterosexual uh, relationships are sinful or criminal mm -hmm. or are sick. And yet, if you look at um, the past, going back to antiquity, including uh, antiquity in Africa, you will find evidence of same-gender primary uh, relationships. And that doesn't mean, I, I'm not, I never debate uh, with anyone right or wrong, mm -hmm. you know, around sexual orientation, because that to me is not the point. The point is, it's true, it exists. Yeah. You know, all of us know uh, who've lived in black communities that there are people in those communities who are not heterosexual or who are not heterosexual all the time. And what I've tried to illuminate uh, is that reality, and then also to try to get some better understanding between and amongst the different parts of our family. We can go on, but there's a couple more questions I want to ask you, Ms. Smith. You also write about the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas Senate hearings that reinforce the perception that any black woman who raises the issue of sexual oppression in the African-American community is somehow a traitor to her race? Yes. Give us your perspective on that hearing. Well, I don't think it's a traitor to the race uh, to say that somebody is doing something that's not right, that is not acceptable. Um, in Anita Hill's case, she was bringing charges of sexual harassment. That's not right. Uh, but sexual harassment is only one form of violence against women. Okay. Um, too many black women and other women, too, end up dead as a result of those unexamined attitudes. Okay. And we have a really hor horrible history and relationship with, you know, the so-called uh, criminal justice system or the criminal injustice system and with the police. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that when black women talk about domestic violence and talk about um, uh, sexual uh, violence, uh, sexual assault, etc., we are not necessarily saying, and we will go to the police and all will be solved, you know, because, you know, our communities have been invaded and have been under siege, you know, to this very day mm -hmm. from the police, although the police indeed do need to treat victims, you know, of that mm -hmm. kind of violence with respect, you know, and with, uh, you know, uh, concern. But the thing is that, you know, I know that we have, there are more layers to it than just saying, you know, uh, that black men who, pro who uh, perpetrate such, you know, crimes mm -hmm. should be prosecuted. That's too simplistic. Barbara Smith, author of the book, The Truth That Never Hurts, writing on race, gender, and freedom, published by Rutgers University Press.